All right, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Airbus 320 Tech Talk. What do all those buttons do? Thank you again so much for joining me. The topic of today's discussion is going to be the EIS switching panel in the A320 flight deck. But as always, before we get started, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, please hit the like button, hit subscribe, leave comments down below, all that kind of good stuff. It just helps me keep the channel moving forward here. So thank you so much if you have done so already. I'll go ahead and bring up the slide that we're gonna talk about today. So we are down here on the center pedestal now talking about this guy right here, the EIS switching panel. So EIS, what does this term stand for first of all? It stands for electronic instrument system. And as you assume, you know, looking in, inside the cockpit of something like an Airbus, you, know, you have all these electronic instruments that feed data to the pilots. And this is of course a sharp contrast to the ways of old when you had these analog steam gauges that just function plainly in a, in a completely different manner. And so there's a lot of, a lot of added you know, layers of redundancy that need to be brought in and applied and you know, allowed access to the pilots when you have this sort of electronic system. Because you know, it, it, at some points in time, you know, there will be failures of certain portions of the input you know, data points in, into the system and everything. We still wanna be able to port these, the, this information onto different screens if there were some problems, either, the, either with the instrument the information coming in or the screens themselves we always need to have you know some backup ways to be able to feed this very important stuff to us as the pilots as we're flying around so that's really what this the switching panel is all about is just it allows us to have some reversionary modes to salvage data or you know get a screen back you know to see some certain things like we said in, in the event that something was malfunctioning underneath the hood there so I'll bring up a different slide because I want to show you a little bit more detail about what those uh, the actual positions on the switches are. That that photo that I took was kind of at an angle, so it wasn't the greatest one to, to use to talk about this. But let's bring up the, the the graphic out of the book here, the switching panel here. We're just going to go from the right to the uh, excuse me from the left to the right. And we'll talk about each one of these the switches here. So the first one we see is the attitude and the heading switching knob. Now, first of all, the the Switching knob lives in the normal position. That, of course, is the same case with all these knobs in the flight deck. And as you would imagine, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, these just stay in the normal position. These types of failures, thankfully, are very rare, let's say. So we're really not down here routinely manipulating these switches, and it would have to be some sort of bad malfunction that, that would cause you to do so. But of course, if you had an issue with any one of these systems, you're going to have some indication come along with it, likely on the ECAM or you know, uh, some little flags or some text that, that appears on one of your screens, maybe alerting you to this issue. But like we started to say, the first one, the attitude and the heading information. If you remember back to the talk where we, we went over the ADIR system, so the air data, air data and inertial reference systems in the airplane, remember there's three of them. And normally the captain's side gets fed by the number one system. The FOs comes off the number two. And we have that number three system there, kind of backing everything up and waiting there in standby if something were, were not going right. So in the spirit of that idea there, you know, this, the attitude and heading knob there is there in the case that let's say we were getting bad attitude or heading information out of either of those, the one or two uh, eight ears there, you could switch the knob over to the number three side, depending if it was the captain or the FO getting bad data uh, onto the number three side there as, as a backup. And you could, you know, hopefully get things switched over and now you've got good attitude and heading information again. Same kind of concept with the air data knob here. Everything I just described uh, all more or less still applies. And you know, one thing I wanted to mention about the air data one is that you know, this is a, um, a place that's it's very important when we go over the scenario of an unreliable airspeed type of thing that might occur in Airbus. Um, we, we very quickly need to get to this point where we, we salvage that data. And so, you know, once again, you know, you're, you're going to go through the troubleshooting steps that the book outlines. The first thing you're going to do is you know, apply the memory item. You're going to fly the airplane and maintain control of the situation. But after that, after you get things stabilized, you would go in the book. And in the QRH, it's just one of the line items there that talks about trying to isolate which system is malfunctioning. And then from there, you're going to switch either the captain or the FO onto the number three side. And that's one interesting thing to mention, too, with, with both these scenarios here is that if the way they've designed it is that, you know, they've they've determined it so unlikely that, you know, the number one and the number two are going to go down at the same time. So that's, it's an interesting way that they've designed the switches that not either the captain or the FO isn't, you know, you, you can't feed them both the number three side data, if that makes sense, which is just a, just an interesting little nuance of the system to make mention of. The next one moving to the right there is the, the EIS DMC knob. Now, 
There's another graphic that I wanted to bring up to talk a little bit more about this DMC concept. So the, the, um, the acronym specifically stands for Display Monitoring Computer. And the way you can kind of think about this is, let's say you know, your TV at home, you have like a coaxial cable that comes out of the wall and it's just bringing in all this raw digital data inside of your house. Well, once it gets to the house, it goes through this little cable box, right? And it descrambles everything in the cable box send signals out to your TV so you can actually see a picture on your screen. And that's really the same kind of concept of what's happening here, which is the DMC. It's intaking all this internal inputted data from the system and it's, it's processing it however it does. And then it has the ability to feed it out to those screens specifically. So, you know, um, the, the DMC switching ability, like we said, you know, normally the, the number one side feeds the captain's, uh, you know, PFD and nav display there. Number two side, of course, feeds the FO side. But if either one of these DMC one or two was malfunctioning, you could you know switch it over on the DMC DMC three, and it would route the appropriate information out to those screens there. And you know this graphic itself, if you look at it, this this does not necessarily um, lay out the you know the the direction of information flow. Let's say this is just like a general graphic that just the book is talking about the the system as a whole. So you know, don't spend too much time looking about the actual piping and these lines, um, about where they're going in this specific instance, because, you know, this, the lines might look a little bit different if you're using this reversionary mode, so don't get too hung up there. But that's all I wanted to tell you, just to, to have that high-level concept about, like, what a DMC is and what it's doing for you. So, you know, we go back to the, um, the graphic here. Switching that knob is just going to allow the, the captain or the FO to use you know, DMC three in either case. So you're, you're switching to a different cable box. Let's think of it in that regard. And then the last one, uh, the eCam nav display transfer. Um, this is a, a little bit different concept. And let's go back to uh, our, um, our, our big zoomed out picture here. So if there was to be a malfunction of both these center screens, right? These are, these center screens are extremely important, of course, for, for having this, um, the engine and warning display, so we know exactly what our engines are doing, and you know what sorts of malfunctions might be happening, and of course, you know the ability to look at system status information. Um, like we said, in the rare circumstance that both these screens went down, you need to have a way to get that information onto either side of the um, the flight deck here, so you can still you know, gather all those details, of course. So. Switching that knob to the FO side, it would just it would make the EWD switch over onto the nav display screen. Same thing if you went over to the captain side. I think generally the rule of thumb is that the, the pilot flying would maintain both his PFD and his nav display, and you would put the the EWD onto the the non-flying pilot side if you ever were in the situation. But you certainly have the ability to switch back and forth depending on whatever you needed to do or look at and whatever scenario was coming your way. So that's pretty much all I had to tell you guys about the EIS switching panel. If you have any more questions about that, please leave them down in the comment section. I'll be more than happy to field them for you. So hope everybody's having a wonderful day. Thank you so much for tuning in again, and we'll talk again real soon.